Welcome everyone to the first ASCE Earth Retention Structures Web Conference. My name is Joel Delaria and I'm a member of the ASCE Earth Retention Structures Committee. We are excited to bring you this web conference free of charge. Today we get to hear from six talented engineers representing over 150 years of experience across the numerous types of earth retaining structures. We are pleased to welcome engineers from around the world uh, to this event. There are just over 600 different companies, universities, government engineering agencies represented in the audience today. The Earth Retention Committee came up with the idea for this conference over a year ago and submitted the idea to the GEO Institute. The committee wanted to give the entire engineering community the opportunity and access to hear the ASCE convention, quality speakers, and presentation. The GEO Institute provided the committee with a grant that has been used to make this web conference a reality. This, is, this web conference is the first of its type for the GEO Institute, and we hope the first of many more to come. In your confirmation emails, you should have received a link to the conference schedule showing you the order and approximate timing of the conference. In a little bit, I'll show you another way to access the schedule. Before we start, we would like to thank each of our speakers who have all invested significant time to prepare these presentations for you. Keith Moser, PE, President of GMO Enterprises in Virginia. Barry Seal, PE, Senior Geotechnical Engineer with FHWA in Colorado. Kevin Dawson, PE, Vice President with Hayward Baker in New England. Stan Vitan, PE, PhD, Associate Professor at University of Michigan, or Michigan Technological University. John Edens, PE, Senior Design Engineer with Hare Baker in Texas. And Jim Schmidt, PE, PENG, DGE, Director of Transportation and Infrastructure at Terracon in Washington State. The conference was made possible through the hard work of the Earth Retention Committee. We would specifically like to thank Demetrius Constantakos, ERS Committee Chair, Glenn Anderson, ERS Committee Secretary, Franciscus Hardianto, and Joel Delaria, or me. Next, we would like to thank ASCE's Geo Institute staff, Brad Keeler, the Director, Diane Specker, and Tatiana Lasovia. This co conference is being broadcast by OnStream Media, Nadia Cortez, and Nancy Bernstein with OnStream have taught us how to use this platform and the many ways to deliver content with it. Finally, Allison Phillips, a promising Rose Holman student, has done a significant amount of work to organize all the materials, presentations, and announcements so everything smooth, flows smoothly. Next, we'd like to introduce you to our sponsors and partners. ERS. Engineers and supplies materials for many earth retention systems. Their team has the experience to solve any earth retention situation. Please visit www.earthretention.com for more details. Deep Excavation. Deep Excavation is a developer of Deep, Ex Deep Excavation design software that is used by more than 1,000 engineers worldwide. Please visit deepexcavation.com and sign up for a free demo. Jet Filter Systems. David Gentry is a licensed marine contractor and founder of Jet Filter System and Blue Marlin Marine Construction. To help prolong seawall life and reduce maintenance costs, David designed a weep hole filter. The filter with a cleanable cartridge functions to relieve hydrostatic pressure while keeping soil from eroding. The Jet Filter line has expanded to include ABS, power-coated steel, and stainless steel, and supports different retaining structures such as steel, vinyl, and concrete. David graduated from the Divers Institute of Technology in Seattle, Washington, and is a professional deep sea diver. Hayward Baker. Hayward Baker is part of the Keller Group of Companies, offers design build services for any geotechnical technical construction application. These include foundation rehabilitation, settlement control, liquefaction mitigation, soil stabilization, groundwater control, slope stability, excavation support, and underpinning. Hayward Baker is headquartered in Hanover, Maryland, and works continent-wide from 35 offices throughout North and South America. Visit www.haywardbaker.com for further information. 
The final portion of the introduction is to share with you the two ways you can interact with the speakers and the main conference team. There are two buttons on the lower left-hand corner of your screen, the Materials button and the Ask a Question button. First, the Ask a Question button. When you click on the button, a text box appears in which you can type a question. Throughout this conference, we will encourage you to ask the speakers questions while they are presenting. The questions will be ranked and sorted during each presentation. At the conclusion of the presentation, the speaker will answer as many questions as time allows. Instead of waiting until the end of the presentation, we recommend that sending in your questions while the presenter is giving his presentation. As a simple reminder, don't forget to hit the Submit Question button. The Materials button contains information you will want throughout the conference. Click on this button and you will find many different resources, including the schedule, sponsor information, links to the conference survey, and the FHWA soil ma nail manual. About three hours at the, after the conclusion of this event, the link used to enter the live event becomes a link you can use to rewatch the event. You will also be able to access all the content in the materials section of the archived event. Another way to access the conference in the upcoming weeks will be to go to the Geo Institute YouTube channel. PDHs. At the conclusion of the conference, we will make two different versions of continuing education credits available in the materials section. The majority of the states are self-reporting, meaning that your attendance does not need to be verified for you to get credit for the two hours of professional training. In these states, we have a certificate of completion that will be available to download free of charge at the end of the conference. A few states, Florida, Indiana, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, and North Carolina require your attendance to be verified to receive the continuing education credits. We have partnered with PDH Online to provide attendance verification in accordance with these states' requirements. Instructions will be provided on how to obtain the verified certificates. It will cost attendees $10 or $6 with a discount code we will provide. Since attendance must be verified, you will not be able to download these certificates for one week while we compile attendance records. Two action items for those of you who need a verified PDH certificate. First, make sure you register for the conference yourself, even if you are viewing as part of a larger group in a conference room. If you haven't registered, you can still register yourself throughout this conference. We will have a coffee break in the middle of the conference, and that might be an ideal time to register if you haven't already. All that is required is your name, email address, and organization name. Second. Make sure that someone from your company is signed in the conference for the duration of the presentation to ensure your attendance is verified. We want to encourage teams to participate in the conference together, and we will assume you are watching with coworkers if you do not log in individually to this conference. Now that we've taken care of the housekeeping items, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Keith R. Moser. P.E. earned his bachelor's degree and master's degree in 1991 and 1993 from Virginia Tech. He founded GMO Enterprises in 2002 to provide geotechnical engineering services in the mid-Atlantic region, specializing in design and construction of retaining walls. Since that time, GMO has provided design-build consulting services on over 500 projects and several million square feet of retaining walls. Keith has pioneered the development of the hybrid wall systems that combine different structural systems while providing uniform architectural appearance. His presentation today will cover the General Services Building Retaining Wall Project in Washington, D.C. We now turn this conference over to Keith. Well, thank you, Joel, for that introduction, and uh, thank you, everybody, for logging in today, and thanks to the GEO Institute for organizing this event. And as we get started on this first web conference, I guess I am the first guinea pig for this new format for presenting, so if you uh, Please forgive any glitches we have throughout the day. We will do our best. Uh, as you can see, topic here, uh, and my name was already introduced uh, to get right into it. Construction for this project began in the summer of 2013 and ran through the winter of 2015. The design development took uh, about a year prior to construction. You can see the credits on the right. The project team was extensive to bring all of this to fruition. And I would particularly like to thank Hensel Phelps, the general contractor who brought me in as a consultant to put forward this design-build solution. There's a little bit of a delay in slide uh, delivery, so forgive me for that. Uh, to, to look at an overall view, 
From north to south of the site, you see Beach Drive, which is part of the Rock Creek Parkway system. Across Rock Creek, we have in the blue shaded area the General Services Building, which is underneath that parking deck. The red lines represent two tieback walls, part of the original construction that were installed as uh, to, to separate the existing slope from the north road downhill to the General Services Building. The yellow line represents the retaining wall that we built, and the orange lines represent a future bus lane and proposed ramps for a garage that is to be built on top of the General Services Building. And also the, the orange line for the bus ramp roughly corresponds to where we had a temporary excavation bench with a temporary soil mail system to facilitate construction. As we go to the next slide, uh, we discuss the project criteria. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the general services building is going to get additional levels of parking on top, and the uh, original tieback walls were partially failing. Um, there was some stress cracking in the structure of the general services building, possibly slow movement downhill, and in order to reinforce that structure, the goal was to remove load from the general services building by building this retaining wall. Also critical is that the aesthetics were very critical because of the Rock Creek Parkway, the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission was uh, requiring that the retaining wall resemble, really look exactly like the stone walls that are across the parkway, across the creek. So they specified a system of molding the existing stones on the Rock Creek Parkway wall, uh, a specific section of the wall that they chose, which was then used to create custom form liners for what was originally intended to be a cast-in-place wall. Uh, the 42-foot maximum grade separation and 860-foot-long wall uh, originally had a, uh, was designed for soldier piles and tieback. As you can see in this picture here, um, the, the tieback wall would have extended above the cut section, so there, there would have been both cut and fill required for this. Uh, obviously, a soldier pile and cast in place wall is, is expensive. Um, noise and construction sequence were issues because this is a zoo, and the work would have needed to be done at night, and that would have been very disturbing for the animals. Um, and site access was also difficult, having to bring long piles into the site and deliver them and then install them using a crane. That would have been very challenging, uh, also because the partial cut and partial fill sections of the wall, installing tiebacks above grade uh, where there's basically just airspace behind the wall, would have been difficult to pre-stress those tiebacks without pulling the soldier piles back into the void, so to speak, not to mention afterwards having to backfill around the tieback tendon. Uh, so all of those issues with, with sequencing and access, not to mention the difficulty of delivering high-quality cast-in-place concrete with the custom forming requirements and all the waterproofing details associated, the project team decided to put forward a value engineering solution consisting of a hybrid soil nail MSE system. Uh, the stone options that we looked at for delivering the, the, the appearance were first the cast-in-place that was specified, and we looked at precast, and we actually had a, a, a test section of sculpted shot pre. We eventually chose the precast as the best option. Geotechnical design uh, considerations, obviously soil parameters are important for the geotechnical design. This being a, a residual soil area, uh, we have very good confidence in the pullout resistance that we estimated for design. And the stand-up ability of the soil uh, for the natural soils. However, there was a layer of existing undocumented fill, about 10 feet deep at the deepest, uh, underlain by the residual silky sand, weather rock transition zone, and then anywhere from zero to 10 feet of competent rock at the bottom. And because of this existing fill, as I mentioned, there was a temporary excavation at the North Road. There wasn't really any stand-up time, so the soil mill contractor, subsurface construction, elected to do a system of micropiles and tiebacks just in that area of the temporary wall in order to account for the, the inability of the soil to stand up long enough for us to get the work done there. Uh, and as you can see, as I fumble through the slide process here, as you can see in this next uh, image, we had very good data. We had seismic profiles. You can see the red indicates the softer soils representing the existing fill. So we really knew what we were getting into there and had it very well documented from the start. Uh, construction phasing was difficult because of the small site and the tight conditions. 
You see the yellow there is the first phase of soil nail construction and excavation. And as we uh, get that excavation done, we have to transport the soil down to a very limited stockpile area in the construction yard there. And once that portion of the excavation is complete, that allows us to begin work on phase one of the GSB building renovations. And then we move on to phase two of the soil nail excavation and installation. And as we're making that excavation, we then move up to the, the green areas where we're building now the MSD fill by just transporting cut from the phase two area up to phase one of the MSD. We can then, with the completion of the soil nails in phase two, get phase two work of the GSB building underway, and then finally build the MSD for phase two as we remove the last of the soil stockpile. And so, what, as I mentioned before, unloading of the GSB building was an important consideration in phasing. So we had to demonstrate through all the various phases of construction, all the different stages of soil nail installation, the different uh, loading conditions and unloading conditions. And we did that by a series of, of essentially global stability analyses and other analyses to show that at each at each interval of construction, we were not we were, we were unloading, really, and not adding any load to the existing GSD building, which was the goal of the project. So I skipped really one slide. Quickly, let me go back and show the two red arrows are two pinch points where the existing tieback walls were. It was very tight construction in those areas, overall very tight. In those areas, very tight. You can see the existing tieback wall on the right and the soil nail work on the left. You can see the guys testing soil nails there in the foreground the excavator in the background, very tight construction. Here's another view looking from the other end of the project site. And you can see as you zoom in on that yellow uh, wedge up there, uh, that yellow wedge is, is on top of one of the benches for the soil nails. And you see that skid steer kind of walking around the corner of that pitch point there. So it was very tight, steep terrain, uh, very challenging. And, and not to mention we had greater than a 90 minute concrete haul uh, so sequencing and phasing the construction was, was, was very critical, not only to the design, but also to the control of the finished project. Uh, load combinations, obviously earth pressure and surcharging for the geotechnical portion. We also had a temporary load of 150-ton crane that was located directly on top of, uh, directly on top of the MSC, right behind the wall face. So that was a huge load that we had to account for, uh, for installing the precast. And then the future bus lane and ramps that we're going to be going in, all loading the soil nails and the shotcrete and the MSC. In addition to that, earthquake and wind loading and the various appurtenances attached to the wall. So the uh, structural precast, uh, really veneer, could attach to the, pre to the shotcrete uh, and be able to resist uh, potential earthquake loading, uh, wind load actually sucking the panels off of the wall and the various appurtenances attached to the wall. Next here, sorry for the delay. So with all of those various structural load com combinations, uh, there was quite a lot of calculation involved in all of the various details, temporary and permanent loadings, the ramps, the surcharges, uh, load and resistance factor design for the various conditions, and all of that. So there was, there was quite a lot of analysis involved. And so we see the typical section with the MSC on top and soil nails on the bottom. Green in this picture represents the precast with a red air space and yellow as the, uh, the shotcrete section. Uh, we had mostly MSC uh, with soil nails, all MSC were possible, and, and low height CIP walls where it was economical. So in this photo, you see a cantilevered yellow cantilever concrete wall, red air space, green precast. Connection details uh, you see at the, the, the green shading shows the footing connection very much like tilt-up construction, and the yellow shows the connection to the shotcrete. And so at, at the footing, you have the red showing the embedded plates in the footing and in the precast. Yellow is the shim stack, and green is the weld strap. And the next slide, we have the uh, precast to shotcrete connection. Yellow is the shotcrete, red airspace, green precast. And the detail in the shotcrete, yellow is the well plate with two options for anchorage. Green is a typical Nelson stud. Red is a bent bar. Um, I like the idea of the bent bar because I was concerned about shotcrete consolidation behind these plates in that blue zone. Uh, the contractors chose the Nelson studs because that's what they were used to, and it turns out we did get consolidation problems. So we had to pull test all of the well plates to make sure that we had the loads. The loads weren't very heavy, but we did have to pull test them to make sure they would perform. 
And so uh, on the precast side, you see yellow representing a studded angle at the back of the precast with the red weld strap over to the weld plate and the shot creep. Back of the precast, we have blue representing a water stop. Purple is the shim stack, and green is masonry uh, mortar. And then as the construction sequence, so the bottom panel is welded to the footing and then to the shot creep. And then subsequent stacked panels go up the wall, welding to the shot creep connection detail that I showed previously. Uh, the MSC detail, you can see again the green as the precast, yellow is the shot creep, and the red represents the connection of the shot creep to the MSC. The earth pressures are all handled by the MSC system itself, but we had to connect the shot creep to the MSC, and we did that by embedding epoxy coated rebar into the backfill with a hooked bar at the front uh, that would then be encapsulated in the shot creep to resist the wind and earthquake loads there. And so as we uh, move on to the different wall elements you see in this picture, we have uh, representing 543 permanent soil nails, six rows, five foot bench height, 15 to 35 feet long, designed for six inches conservatively, and the contractor load tested and was able to reduce that to four and three quarters, double corrosion corrected nails, uh, 21,000 square feet of shot creep for the soil nails, uh, eight inches thick for the soil nails, five inches at the MSC, you can see in the photo, red represents the weld plates, blue is the soil nail heads, yellow is the drainage boards, and green are the soil nails that have been installed. And uh, this is just a layout view showing uh, one segment of the wall with all the soil nails. And if you'll notice that they follow along the grade of the site, uh, and that's important later when I talk about the MSC work. As we move to the next slide, also transition, you can see in this slide as uh, it's coming up slowly on my screen. There, oh, that's, I'm sorry, that's a view of the completed soil nails. And let me go to the next slide. And we have, okay, the, behind the yellow, you see the temporary soil nail wall. Um, and in front, you see the permanent shot creep and soil nail wall. That red zone is where we're transitioning from soil nail shot creep to MSE shot creep. The MSE has yet to be built there. So we were concerned about making sure we had good transition at that joint, so to speak, a, a major cold joint, construction joint. So we had dowels at the top of the shot creep section uh, there so that we could get a good tight joint at that location. Not much load on that location, but we still wanted very tight tolerance and, and control to be able to install the precast. So here you see a photo of the bottom course of MSE and molded wire fabric baskets. You see how they're running on grade meaning that they're parallel to the ground surface. Later, we moved to horizontal um, layers of geogrid, but at the very bottom, that made it so that we didn't have to bench the top of the soil nails and made the construction really expedient. You can see the green representing all of the MSC, the epoxy dowels, and uh, you see also the uh, fall protection is serving as double duty. We had very tight tolerance to build the MSC vertical. You see the black in that photo represents the MSC being built on top of the soil nails. The two by four batter boards are doing two things. They're controlling the tolerance of the MSC and they're also serving as fall protection at the top of the MSC wall. Now you see the footing at the bottom, basically a leveling pad. You see the red squares representing the embed plates that, that are welded onto the footing. And that, that vertical yellow line is a drain running from the gravel zone that's at the bottom of the MSC, at the back of the MSC, uh, in order to keep any kind of, uh, you know, water seepage issues uh, from getting into that airspace and causing corrosion. And this next photo, you can see uh, one of the smaller areas with the cantilever concrete footings uh, where the wall really wasn't very tall and there was really no room to do MSD. You also notice the precast, you have a, the beginnings of the paint that's being applied. It was a multi-stage painting process and it was very intricate and, and very expertly done. Now, the precast uh, erection, you see the crane up on top, on top of the MSC, very rapid installation. Um, it's actually a typo. There was over 30,000 square feet of precast, 32-foot long, 8-foot high panels, 7 inches thick. So they said rapid installation, and this tooth shape that you see at the bottom of the panel on the trailer allowed us to mask the horizontal joints so that it didn't look like precast. It looked like uh, a, a masonry stone wall. And as you can see, the finished finish product is very attractive with the custom painting, all of the caulking and mortar in place, capstones and uh, railing, and the stairs attached to the wall. And as you can imagine, with that kind of quality control, uh, it is important that we uh, have very tight inspections. And this being the, the National Zoo, we, we were able to utilize the local population uh, in order to 
uh, facilitate our quality control. Um, this one, the 2016 Washington Builders Conference Craftsmanship Award for Precast Concrete and Specialty Painting, and uh, that was in due to the, the, the high quality craftsmanship uh, and, of course, the, the local inspectors that we were able to retain to uh, make sure that everything was done to spec. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll take any questions now. Thank you, Keith, for the excellent case history. Uh, congratulations on the 2016 WC Craftsmanship Award. Um, after each presentation, as a reminder, we'll have a brief time for questions. I'll just show you the slide one time. Um, you can ask questions uh, at the button on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. With that, we'll turn it back over to Keith um, so he can answer a few questions for you. Okay, thank you. The first question that asks, in design, how did you include or account for the deformation of the MSC wall and the termination of construction tolerances, given that the tolerances were very tight? Uh, well, it's important when building one of these MSC walls that you use uh, gravel directly behind the, in, the, in the zone of the welded wire fabric forms and where the wrap is installed. Um, if you use gravel and have very good compaction of the gravel and compaction of the soil behind, you're able to manage that tolerance lift to lift, uh, and there really shouldn't be much movement post-construction. It was only about 10 feet of MSE anyway, so there wouldn't be much movement to begin with. Um, and, uh, you know, we had that extra air space as, to give us a little bit of flow and the batter boards that I showed previously. Okay, so I think the, uh, the, the next question that I have is what software did you use for stability analysis? I used uh, G-Stable software uh, by Gregory Geotechnical Services to do, to do most of the global stability analysis. You know, some hand checks myself to do, um, you know, kind of base sliding analysis. Well, I, I say hand checks, I really need spreadsheets. Um, and uh, then the rest of it I use just spreadsheet calculations using ACI. Uh, requirements for concrete. Uh, next question, what factor of safety did you use for slope stability analyses given the short-term nature of the construction? Well, actually, we used um, 1.5 as the global stability factor because even though the construction was short-term, the wall is permanent. It's going to be there. It's going to be supporting an active road, active bus ramp, and future ramps to this parking garage. So we used factor of safety of 1.5 five for global stability. And I guess that I think was the last question. Um, the 90-minute concrete hall, the concrete was not dry batched. Uh, we did not have any water added to the site. We did use a little bit of um, some additives to control the set in the colder weather, um, but um, it, it, it wasn't too much of a problem for us. And I think that's the last question. Thank you all very much, and I look forward to hearing the next presentation. Thank you very much, Keith, for your presentation. Um, sorry for all the questions that we were not able to get to. Um, throughout this conference, we're going to briefly reintroduce you to our sponsors. Hayward Baker is part of the Keller Group of Companies and offers design-build services for any geotechnical construction application, including foundation rehabilitation, settlement control, liquefaction, mitigation, soil stabilization, groundwater control, slope stability, excavation support, and underpinning. Hayward Baker is headquartered in Hanover, Maryland, and works continent-wide from 35 offices throughout North and South America. Visit haywardbaker.com for further information. With that, we move on to Barry Seal. Barry Seal PE is a senior geotechnical engineer with the Federal Highway Administration in the Resource Center in Lakewood, Colorado. Barry has 32 years of experience, 29 with FHWA, and has been working with the design and construction of soil nail walls for 15 years. There's a link to the FHWA soil nail manual in the materials section that Barry will be discussing. We now welcome Barry and his presentation covering advances in soil nail design and construction. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, in, in 2015, FHWA published a new geotechnical engineering circular called GEC-7 Soil Nail Wall Reference Manual. This manual is an update of our 2003 version of the GEC-7 
and it will serve as a reference manual for the new NHI training course. Last week, we held the pilot for this new training course, and it will be available for order through NHI later this fall. The purpose of this presentation is to discuss the major updates in the 2015 version of GEC 7 as compared to the 2003 version. The first update is an, the introduction of a framework for the design of sole nail walls that takes into account the safety factors used in allowable stress design while integrating load and resistance factor design principles and tech terminology. The second update looks at recommended considerations for the use of hollow bar soil nails. With allowable stress design, the goal is to make sure that the allowable resistance is greater than some of the loads. This places all of the uncertainty on the resistance side of the equation. The recommended ASD safety factors for all of the various soil nail wall failure modes have been established and are presented in GEC 7. With load and resistance factor design, the uncertainty is associated with both sides of the equation by applying both load factors and resistance factors. The LRFD equation can be rewritten to calculate the capacity to demand ratio with the goal being to achieve a CDR as close to one as possible, but not less than one. For soil nail wall design in LRFD, the limit states that need to be considered are strength, service, and extreme, and the loads that need to be considered are permanent, transient, and seismic. To be consistent with AASHTO, the load factors that have been established for other retaining structure types are used for soil nail wall design. Note that for the extreme event loading and the service limits state, the load factors are always one. For permanent loads, the load factor depends on the type of loading <coughs> with maximum and minimum load factors depending on whether the load is stabilizing or destabilizing, respectively. For soil nail wall design in LRFD, the limit states that need to be considered are overall stability, strength, extreme, and service. The overall stability includes failure surfaces that intersect one or more nails, failure surfaces that do not intersect any nails, and basal heave. Strength limit states are divided into geotechnical and structural. The geotechnical strength limit states are lateral sliding and soil nail pullout, which is a function of the ground to grout bond. The structural strength limit states are rupture of the tendon and the various failure modes of the facing, including flexure, punching shear, and rupture of the headed studs for the permanent facing. The only extreme limit state considered is seismic loading. The service limit states considered are lateral displacement and wall settlement. The resistance factors used for soil nail wall design are consistent with AASHTO, but not necessarily the same as values currently in AASHTO for other retaining wall types. In, 20, in the 2015 GEC 7, a procedure is presented that allows the designer to verify resistances in an LRFD platform using load factors from AASHTO and results from ASD-based limit equilibrium slope stability analysis. The resistance factors for LRFD are presented in GEC 7 and were derived to be related to ASH, one, related to AASHTO load factors, two, comparable with, but not necessarily equal to the resistance factors presented in AASHTO for other retaining structures, related to ASD safety factors provided 
in the previous version of GEC-7 so as to fit with past practice, and four, consistent with the minimum required frequency of sole nail testing. The next few slides show examples of how this was done. For overall stability, the load factor is 1.00. From the, from the load factor, uh, ash, or from the load factor ashto table that we saw earlier. The back calculated resistance factor is 0 0.65. This gives an equivalent safety factor of 1.54, which is a little more than the ASD safety factor of 1.5. Therefore, for overall stability, the LRFD design is more conservative than the ASD design. This difference in conservatism can be attributed to ASHTO practice that load and, resist, load and resistance factors are multiples of 0 0.05, and that back-calculated sole nail wall resistance factors were selected such that the results were no less conservative than the ASD design. For sole nail pullout, the ASHTO load factor is 1.35 for vertical earth pressure for walls, and the back-calculated resistance factor is 0 0.65. This gives an equivalent safety factor of 2.08, which is more conservative than the ASD factor's safety factor of 2.0. This example is for tension in the tendon. The ASHTO load factor is 1.35 for ver vertical earth pressure for walls. The back calculated resistance factor depends on the grade of the steel. For lower strength tendons, the back calculated resistance factor is 0 0.75, giving it an equivalent safety factor of 1.8, which is the same as for the ASD safety factor. For higher strength tendons, the back calculated resistance factor is 0 0.65, giving it an equivalent safety factor of 2.08, which is more conservative than the ASD safety factor of 2.0. For the service limit state, the ASHTO load factor is 1.00. The movements considered are lateral and vertical wall displacement, which is typically greatest at the top of the wall face. In GEC-7, uh, presents a simplified, empirically-based procedure to estimate these movements as a function of soil condition and wall height. But the wall displacements are dependent on other factors as well, as are uh, shown here on this slide. Sole nail walls are designed in ASD using available computer programs. The results from these programs can, be, can then be verified in the LRFD platform using established ASHTO load factors and resistance factors that are calibrated to ASD to check that the CDR is 1.0 or greater. The second update in the 2015 GEC-7 looks at considerations for the use of hollow bar soil nails. These recommendation, recommended considerations deal with installation procedures, estimated bond strength, appropriate corrosion protection, and soil nail load testing procedures. Verification load tests are conducted on sacrificial nails to verify that the estimated bond capacity, which is subsequently proven out with a prescribed frequency of proof load tests on production or sacrificial nails. Items that are monitored to ensure that the production nails are installed in the same manner as the verification nails are drilling rate, grout pressure, drill bit characteristics, and soil type. FHWA, along with Schnabel Engineering and ADSC, conducted a field, test, field load test program on com to compare bond capacities between solid bar soil nails and hollow bar soil nails and found that in granular soils, bond strengths were consistently higher for the hollow bar soil nails. These results should be taken into consideration when estimating bond strengths for hollow bar soil nails as GEC-7 only lists estimated bond strengths for solid bar soil nails.
For the solid bar soil nails, there are three classes of corrosion protection. The appropriate class of corrosion protection is selected depending on the aggressiveness of the soil and the risk tolerance for the wall. For hollow bar soil nails, class A and class B corrosion protection are not feasible due to the installation method, which precludes encapsulation and can seriously damage any type of coating, whether epoxy or galvanizing or, or any other type of, of coating. This really leaves only class C corrosion protection or sacrificial steel. This also means that hollow bar soil nails should not be used in aggressive soil conditions. Verification and proof testing requirements for hollow bar soil nails are the same as for solid bar soil nails. The issue is how to provide the required unbonded length when the nail that is with a nail that is fully grouted during installation. A common method of providing this unbonded length is to attach a PVC sleeve to the hollow bar soil nail before installation. This, however, presents the issue of the donut effect, where the grout around the PVC sleeve can influence the load test results, making it difficult to evaluate the actual bond strength. GEC7 provides recommendations for all of these hollow bar soil nail issues, but ultimately leaves the decision up to the wall owner to determine how to inspect the contractor's hollow bar soil nail installation operations, how to specify corrosion protection, and how to conduct load tests. And at this time, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions that you have. Thank you, Barry, for taking us into the FHWA manual and explaining some of the overall design considerations, the transition to the LRFD methodology, and how to use hollow bars instead of a more traditional solid bar. One slide that really stood out was the slide showing a substantial improvement in the bond strength by switching over to the pressure grouted hollow bars. Um, hopefully, Barry has had enough time to review a few questions, and we'll be ready with some responses now. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. The uh, first question is, why use vertical earth pressure load factor? Aren't the loads more horizontal? Well, the loads are more horizontal on the, the facing, but when you're looking at um, uh, the uh, pull-out capacity, the loads that are coming on the bar, it de kind of depends on the failure mode that you're looking at. You have to, to consider where are those loads coming from, and it's been ter determined that, uh, or it's accepted that the uh, the vertical earth pressure loads are the loads that more affect the, uh, um, those, those failure mechanisms. Uh, second question is, since the load factor and resistance factor has been determined to be comparable to ASD, and since the design has been done using ASD-based programs, have you found that LRFD design has resulted in reduced costs? Uh, I'd have to say no to that, just because, as I was saying before, LRFD design is going to be as conservative or more conservative than ASD. It's been uh, the, the LRFD um, uh, load factors or resistance factors have been set up to be as or more conservative than, than what's in ASD. Uh, but the, because, and remember, they are all back calculated from ASD. We don't have any load factors that have been um, calibrated from uh, load tests. There has been some efforts to do that. There was a, uh, um, a, a uh, report that was developed uh, that, that tried to look at uh, or develop load fa resistance factors for the pull-out capacity of soil nails. Uh, the problem there was twofold. One was the uh, tests that were used for um, developing the, for doing the analysis and developing the, the resistance factors uh, were tests that were, most of the tests were never taken to failure. And so we don't really have uh, a, a true resistance factor based on, on the uh, total capacity of the soil. It's only uh, based on, on tests that were uh, taken to two, two times a, a design or maybe a little bit more than that, but certainly not, uh, not to failure.
Joel, are there any other questions? Yeah. Um, it, with that, I, thank you very for your uh, for your presentation and for answering your questions. I think you can refresh your questions, and there's a few more. We probably have time for two more questions. Okay. Yeah, I see. Okay. How how do you think hollow bar soil nails should be tested? Drill over the or, or drilled over the free land is what it says. Um, you know, there's, there's again, there's uh, this study that we did uh, uh, where we were looking at uh, the, the hollow bar soil nail and versus the solid bar soil nail. One of the things we were looking in that at that as well as the, comparing the, the pull out capacities, we were trying to uh, install a series of hollow bar soil nails using various methods of establishing the free length, and and the the methods are outlined in the the publications that. Uh, um, uh, document that study, um, but in, in addition to using like a PVC sleeve, we also did some flushing. There's issues associated with that. You can also we also use a method where we would case uh, part of the hole and then flush out inside of the casing. Um, all of those resulted in uh, higher uh, pullout capacities. Um, and, and I think that the one with the casing is the one that came out about the best in terms of matching the, the capacities, that, uh, the bond capacities that we saw with the, the solid bar nail. But in any case, the, just the, the installation method, especially when you're in a granular material, uh, the installation method is naturally going to result in a, in a uh, higher, higher bond capacity. Um, I think the main thing to do as, a, as an owner when you're trying to decide which test method you should use or how you should establish that, that free length is to uh, look at the results that are in those studies that were done, uh, see how um, that, the, the, that the various installation methods or the various methods used to establish the, the free zone affected uh, and the, the, uh, the, the test results and to what, to what extent it affected the test results and take that into consideration when you're uh, looking at the results from your test. Well, thank you very much, Barry, for bringing us all of your knowledge about the FHWA soil nail manual. Um, we will continue to move forward with this presentation. Deep Excavation is the developer of DeepX, deep excavation software that is used by more than 1,000 engineers worldwide. Please visit deepexcavation.com and sign up for a free demo. Um, just a quick note for everybody, the, if you ask your questions a little bit sooner, the presenters will be able to um, review them a little bit more. Um, we had a lot of questions right after Barry started answering, and he wasn't able to see them all. Um, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce Kevin Dawson, our last presenter before the break. Kevin Dawson, PE, Vice President with Hayward Baker, oversees the daily operations of the New England office. Kevin is a practicing geotechnical engineer specializing in the design and construction of ground improvement, grounding excavation support, underpinning, drilled micropiles, drilled shafts, and driven pile projects. Without further ado, we pass the microphone over to Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for taking time out of your day to let me share my passion for jet grout underpinning. So today I wanted to spend the majority of the time we have together focusing on two case histories. But for the benefit of the audience members who may not be familiar with jet grouting, I'll briefly discuss the jet grouting process along with the risks that pertain to the use of jet grouting for underpinning applications. So jet grouting is a process where we drill a small diameter hole and inject fluid, either grout or water, at a high velocity to erode the soil adjacent to the drill rod. A portion of the soil is replaced with cementitious grout, yielding a product we refer to as soil creep. In the upper photo you see here, we see an exhumed pair of soil creep columns. One column is vertical and one column is battered. Both the columns were installed from that same drill annulus to create a segment of an underpinning wall. Each segment is typically three to four feet long and is dictated by the soil column diameter. 
Overlapping segments, or SWATs, are installed to create a continuous mass of soilcrete below an existing building wall. In a lower photo, we see an exhumed half column. Occasionally, it's desirable to install portions of columns in cases where we provide underpinning to structures to facilitate construction that is directly adjacent to the edge of the existing footings, installation of half columns for the front vertical column can minimize the required removal of surplus soil creep mass. This is a depiction of what we build from the design perspective. As you can see, the mass of soil creep below the footing is shaped intentionally very much like a gravity earth retention wall. Because the back of the soil creep mass is battered, the earth pressure resolves into vertical and horizontal components. The vertical component helps to resist the overturning and sliding, increasing the efficiency of the system. In cases where the mass of soil creep alone can't suitably resist the overturning and sliding forces, tiebacks can be installed to add external restraint. In some cases, providing external restraint in lieu of adding soil creep mass can be the most efficient overall system. Here we see an 18-foot tall gravity underpinning wall. In this project, the building load provided a sufficient pinning force to facilitate the 18-foot cut without external restraint using one vertical and two to three battered soil creep columns per underpinning slot. So like most things in life, great rewards often come with some risks. While project participants celebrate significant cost and schedule savings that can be realized by utilizing jerkout underpinning in lieu of traditional pit underpinning, it's essential that we maintain a focus on proactive management of risk. Two of the tools that we use to manage risks are the use of data acquisition and geotechnical instrumentation. Jackrouting without data acquisition and geotechnical instrumentation is certainly possible and has been performed on many occasions. However, when we're able to collect, process, and view installation and building movement data in real time, our ability to respond to problems also occurs in real time. The ability to react in real time is an essential tool to manage and limit risk. It enables specialty contractors to perform work with our eyes wide open. So now we'll transition to the presentation of the two case histories. The first case will review the MIT Nano Enabling Project in Cambridge, Massachusetts. During the enabling phase of the project, we installed an earth retention and jackrut underpinning system to facilitate relocation of utilities and provide permanent water cutoff within the, within the footprint of the connector between the new Nano building and the existing buildings 26, 16, and 8. This slide shows a section through the proposed nano building, the existing building 16. And what you see on the left, the red line on the left depicts secant pile earth support wall. The red line on the right depicts the soil creep underpinning wall. And the blue block in the middle depicts the volume of soil that was removed, both for utility relocation and facilitation of construction of the proposed connector. So at locations clear of existing utilities where underpinning of existing structures was not required, we installed a secant pile wall earth support system. And at locations where the secant piles could not be installed due to existing utility conflicts, and at locations where underpinning of the existing structure was required, check routing was performed. We installed a total of about 75 secant piles, each 30 to 45 feet long, and 50 check route columns, approximately 25 feet long. The next three slides so it shows sections through the earth support and underpinning systems. The sections are presented sequentially, starting with section A, that's at the right-hand side of the slide you see now, section B is at the middle of the slide, and section C is at the left. This is section A, where we have a cantilever or secant pile on both sides of the earth support system to facilitate a 20-foot deep cut to install an electric manhole. Section B shows secant piles on one side, on the left side, and jack out earth support and cutoff wall on the other. At this location, the jack routing was performed to underpin the existing pressure-injected footing-supported tunnel. In Section C, we see secant piles on one side and jack underpinning an existing spread footing-supported spread footing utility room on the other. 
And just note that in all of these sections, the secant piles and jacket underpinning column length was dictated by the groundwater cutoff requirement, not necessarily system stability. And now we'll move into the construction sequence. We started with the installation of the secant piles. And during the installation of the secant pile scope, we installed a liquid level monitoring system capable of detecting 0 0.02 millimeters of movement. The system was designed to record data and stamp it back to a remote website every 10 seconds. Here's a plan view of the liquid cell locations with respect to the jet route column locations. The liquid level cell locations are shown in, in the dark blocks. And these photographs show the main components of the liquid level system and how we mounted each component within the existing tunnel. At locations where interior access to the structure was not possible, we mounted the liquid level cells to the exterior of the structure. After installing the monitoring system and mobilizing the jet routing equipment, we installed confirmatory test columns and commenced production jet routing. And during the installation of the first production jet route column, we realized all the benefits of the data acquisition and electronic monitoring systems. Movement data indicated that the structure moved approximately a quarter of an inch during the installation of the first jet route column. The data acquisition from the jet routing rig indicated consistent efforts to stroke the drill hole, which can be an indication that temporary loss of spoil return was occurring. Although the realized movement didn't exceed the specified project threshold value of half an inch, we terminated the jet routing operation for the remainder of the shift. Armed with the movement data and the acquired rig data, we were able to review the installation procedure and develop remedial methods to manage the risk of the structural heave. After mending the jet routing tooling with a hole reamer and revising the procedure to include drilling of relief holes and pre-cutting, production work resumed the following shift. And here are the movement data obtained during the remainder of the jet routing scope. And we see that the overall residual movement is generally limited to approximately five one hundredths of an inch after the first day of work. The daily fluctuation that you see in the movement data is likely the structural response to the daily thermal cycle of the building. And this is just a perfect example of how we can utilize rig data acquisition and real-time structural movement data to pinpoint and small, solve small problems before they escalate. The following series of slides walks us through the movement data acquired during a typical production day on the project. On the example day, we installed four columns. The installed column locations are shown as yellow circles on each slide, and the nearest liquid level monitoring cells are shown as red squares. Here we see the movement data collected during the entire day from the liquid level cells in close proximity to the work. In each of the next four slides, we have highlighted the time during which each highlighted jet route column was installed. That's the yellow bar encircled the resultant structural movement that was detected from the nearest liquid level cells. Here we see this during the installation of column number 18, the nearest liquid level cells indicate that there was a temporary structural heave of approximately one one hundredth of an inch during the installation of the column with little to no residual movement. We see similar structural response during installation of the remaining three columns. Here's column 21, column 24, and finally column number 28. All these columns were installed with very similar short-term heave and little residual movement. For each jet route column that was installed, we monitored, recorded, and post-processed pertinent installation data, including the depth of the tip of the drill string, the rotation rate of the drill string, and the pull speed, or how fast the drill string was drawn from the ground, the grout pressure, the grout flow rate, and the air pressure when we use air. The data can be reviewed in real time by the driller on the rig, and within minutes, the column completion, the column, minutes of column completion by Hayward Baker site and office management. 
because all data are time stamps, we can superimpose movement data obtained from the liquid level system with the rig acquisition data to pinpoint problems and develop rapid resolution. And here's the finished product. At the end of the day, we have secant piles on the left side of each photo, and you see a duct bank uh, running across the top of the hole. Below the duct bank is a soilcrete mass that was used to seal between the secant piles on the left and the right of the duct bank. So our second case history is the Holyoke Medical Emergency Department expansion. So here, Baker designed and installed a jet route underpinning system to facilitate the construction of the new addition directly adjacent to the existing building entrance portico and the emergency generator pad. 32 underpinning slots consisting of one vertical jet row column and one or two battered jet row columns were installed. Here we see a typical design section and elevation of the underpinning scope. Tiebacks were installed to provide additional restraint to the jet route underpinning system. In this case, the vertical load imposed by the entrance structure and the generator pad were low and provided limited pinning force. Underpinning depths for this project ranged up to 21 feet deep. As we did on the, sorry about that. As we did on the MIT Nano project, we installed a liquid level monitoring system prior to performance of the jet running scope. In this case, all components, including the CPU and data transfer boxes, were mounted on the outside of the structure. On all jet road underpinning projects, we typically install sacrificial pre-production test columns to confirm the assumed column installation parameters are correct. And here we see the tops of the exhumed sacrificial test columns. The next four slides step us through the installation of the jacket underpinning system and the subsequent excavation to final subgrade. In this photo, we are installing columns adjacent to the existing portico. After installation of the soil creek columns, the site was partially excavated to facilitate installation of the tiebacks we are installing in this photograph. And here we see the final excavation to subgrade with soil creek mass and tiebacks installed. This is another view of the final excavation subgrade with the underpin emergency generator above. So the following 15 slides are a series of still shots from an animation we created using the settlement monitoring data viewer. The software enables integration of installation data, location, and time with the collected settlement data. The data integration and visualization software offer a unique way of viewing and presenting data to internal and external project stakeholders. So when I was first notified that I would have the opportunity to present this project today, I was most excited to share the animations developed during the course of this work. But unfortunately, we can't show embedded animations, so we'll have to live with the series of still shots. So in each of the subsequent slides, you'll see some green columns being installed that represents installation of jet route columns. And you'll also notice that the black boxes that represent the locations of the liquid level cells, the data within the box is changing. Those are real-time updates at that particular time snap for the liquid level system. It's just a really unique and great way to visualize data and share it with project teams. So here we see the more traditional settlement monitoring data collected during the course of the project from all the liquid level cells. The magnitude of the overall movement from the start of the jet routing to the end is generally less than three one hundredths of an inch. So here we'll wrap up. So hopefully I've provided a rewarding, although quick overview of two recent successful jet route underpinning projects where we've used geotechnical instrumentation and rig data acquisition to successfully manage inherent risk of jet routing. Careful consideration of the risk-reward relationship is important. Remember, with reward comes risk. Recognize it and actively manage it to generate the best overall project outcome. Electronic monitoring enables specialty contractors to better manage risk and react to problems in real time 
reducing or eliminating slow response times that lead to large problems. Checkrouting is a very powerful tool that can be used in many applications, but not all. Each project has a unique risk profile, and techniques should be matched with the project to limit the overall risk. We encourage early collaboration to ensure best outcomes. So thanks to all of you for your time today, and I hope the taste of checkrouting has left you with a desire to learn more and that you all soon have the opportunity. So with that, I'm happy to move on to questions. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I think we'll take time for three questions, and then after that, we'll have a few brief announcements and we'll transition into a break. With that, Kevin, would you like to uh, begin answering a few questions? Sure thing. Uh, the first question is, what is the maximum period that the support can stay safe? Um, really, the answer to that is it depends on your environmental conditions. So soil creep um, can flake and freeze thaw cycles, but aside from that, it can stay open as long as it needs to. And we've done permanent permanent work in interiors of buildings where the face of the soil creep uh, is faced with either gunite or soil or um, shot creep, and it it's the permanent underpinning uh, inner support system for a structure. So it's really limited by the exposure, the environment of the exposure. Um, the second question is what software was used in the design? You know, so like most other geotechnical design problems, multiple software platforms can be used. Um, you know, with, even within one company, many different engineers may use different softwares. We tend to use CT shoring in New England um, to develop our earth pressure, and we use various other calculations, either in-house or developed ourselves. So it's, uh, the, the main platform we use is CT shoring. Uh, the next question that's here is, what's the maximum diameter shaft you can achieve with jet routing? The answer to the question uh, is really depends on the system. Uh, so there are multiple jet routing systems that are available on the market, each with target diameters. When we limit the question specifically to underpinning, the goal <laughs> is limit to geometry somewhere between three and four feet. And the rationale for that is you don't want to undermine a portion of a footing much longer than four feet. You want to maintain the same regimen that you would use for traditional underpinning. We do have jet route systems that are designed for much larger diameter columns. Traditional double system jetting, we typically target six foot diameter columns, super jet columns, which is a variation of double jetting, can achieve column diameters of 10 to 12 feet. Joel, would you like me to take another question, or are I you think good we're, we're all set. I just couldn't get meat off fast enough. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, that was an excellent presentation, and it's amazing how far real-time monitoring has come in, say, the last 15 years. With that, we're going to... Um, just remind you once again who our sponsors are. We have ERS, um, ERS engineers and supplies material for many earth retention systems. Their team has experience to solve any earth retention situation. Please visit ER, earthretention.com for more details. Jet Filter Systems, David Gentry is a licensed marine contractor and founder of Jet Filter System and Blue Marlin Marine Construction. To help prolong seawall life and reduce maintenance costs, David has designed a weep hole filter. The filter with cleanable cartridge functions to relieve hydrostatic pressure while keeping soil from eroding. The Jet Filter line has expanded to include ABS, power-coated steel, and stainless steel, and supports different retaining structures such as steel, vinyl, and concrete. David graduated from Divers Institute Tech of technology in Seattle, Washington, and is a professional deep sea diver. Deep Excavation is the developer of DeepX, deep excavation design software that is used by more than 1,000 engineers worldwide. Please visit deepexcavation.com and sign up for a free demo. Hayward Baker, part of the Keller Group of Companies, offers design build services for any geotechnical construction application. These include foundation rehabilitation, settlement control, liquefaction mitigation, soil stabilization, groundwater control, slope stability, excavation support, and underpinning. Hayward Baker is headquartered in Hanover, Maryland, and works continent-wide from 35 offices throughout North and South America. 
Visit HaywardBaker.com for further information. And the last slide is a reminder for those of you who need um, attendance verified PDHs that you should make, and you have not signed up yourself, perhaps um, another person in your company did. Please sign up during the break so that we can make sure to get your attendance and send it on over to PDH online. With that, we're going to take a break until 1.20 Eastern time, and we will begin promptly at 1.20. Enjoy your break. We welcome everyone back to the first ERS web conference. Um, over the break, we had a few quick questions. Um, a few people were unable to click a few of the links that are available in the materials section. Um, the links work on the majority of computers. If yours does not work, a solution is likely that you can copy the link and paste it into your web browser as opposed to clicking on it directly. And then last, the uh, PDHs will be up and available by the end of the presentation. Um, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, Stan Vatan. Stan is an associate professor at Mich Michigan Technological University in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He has eight years of industrial experience with the Shell Oil Company. While at Shell, Dr. Vatan was the engineering manager of their su subsidiary, the R&F Coal Company, and a senior mining enge engineer on mining projects across the United States. Dr. Vatan has a bachelor's and master's degree from Michigan Tech covering geological and mining engineering. He also received a PhD in geotechnical engineering from the University of Michigan. We will now travel through, some hi through the history of ERS design with Dr. Vatan. Uh, thanks, to, uh, Noel or Joel. I uh, appreciate the uh, offer, ability to be able to talk to, to you all. Um, so my title is uh, Our Hand Calculation Still Used. Um, so talk about why I'm doing it, the motivation, uh, talk about the sheet pile design examples uh, we decided to use. And then the main part of the talk is going to be called Lessons Learned, and I'm, I want you to highlight the question marks and the statement, the devil's in the details. Um, and then I'll have a conclusion. So, so anyway, the motivation about uh, this came about by my teaching uh, a couple senior design classes uh, that were sponsored by uh, a design build company. Uh, and, and I want to put a little advertisement in here that uh, for you uh, construction design companies, uh, partnering with universities on senior design uh, is really important, and I want to encourage you to do it. Uh, it's a great, great way for all of us to, to learn. Um, anyway, my, my background in sheet pile design I, up front uh, uh, here is uh, I didn't have a background. Um, so I decided uh, when we had a project come up for a DOT to, to help uh, do uh, pr produce a sh uh, sheet pile, uh, pile wall design manual for a training course, uh, we decided to do eight problems uh, and then compare the hand solutions to the com computer solutions. I'm not sure that was a good idea. I'm not sure I'd do that again. Uh, the company uh, was using the software called Support It uh, from Great Britain. Um, and we also, I'm going to note uh, the SPW 511, which is from Pilebuck, which is basically a subset of Support It. So they're basically the same uh, uh, software uh, in any event. So anyway, I thought it'd be a good learning experience, and uh, although, I, as I noted, I'm not a sheet pile design expert. All right, so these are the eight uh, examples that uh, we decided to do. Uh, three of them were cantilevered with uh, granular, cohesive backfill. Uh, two are anchored and granular and cohesive. Uh, two braced wall design examples, the one with a level backfill the granular and the one with cohesive, and then the start for uh, soldier pile wall, a cantilever design. We had two type soil types. The granular was uh, had a pH angle of 32 degrees, and cohesion uh, was uh, 1,500 pounds per square foot. So that was the start. That's how uh, the project started, and I'm going to also talk briefly about my resources. Uh, again, uh, I had not taught foundation design. My background is... Uh, as Joel noted, is more geological and mining related, uh, but uh, the U.S. Uh, Steel Sheet Pile Manual, uh, the 1984 edition, 
uh, the Cal- California DOT Trench Insuring Manual. I want to make a point here that I uh, used the uh, 1990 uh, uh, and revised 96. I didn't use the 2011 because I didn't have it uh, when I started. I uh, wish I had. Um, and then a, a suite of foundation books. And I want to point two out in particular, Tursagi, 1948, and Peck, uh, 1953, re-op- re-edited in 1973. Um, anyway, uh, I started with those, and I ended up with uh, three others that I found to be very useful, Deep Excavation, uh, Theory and Practice by O, uh, the British uh, Sarah C. 580, uh, uh, 2003, and I want to make a note about this because it's very confusing. Uh, uh, people reference the uh, seventh uh, uh, British Piling Handbook, and there's an eighth, but the eighth is published by the Arcelor Ar- uh, Group. So um, that's what it is, and you can download it on the web. Okay, lessons learned. I, um, I picked six of them. There are many. Uh, I picked these six in particular. Uh, I want to just briefly talk about the importance of cantilever design. And, and again, I'm going to point out uh, from a student perspective, teaching uh, sheet pile design for temporary excavations. Uh, talking about the second one, be uh, conventional versus simplistic or the simplified method, a selector, uh, selection of factors of safety, uh, earth pressure determinations for slope backfill. Uh, cohesive soils, they're, they're, they're certainly different than granular, and it's not exactly clear why certain things happen with the equal, equal, uh, limit equilibrium methods. And the last thing we we'll talk about is grace excavation, in particular, the use of the Trisagi pack pressure diagrams. Okay. All right, so the first one, I'm only going to make a quick point here. I've got four images. I hope they're probably not as clear as I'd like them to be. But the upper one is cantilevered wall design. And for a student, uh, they probably assume initially that uh, that's separate from anchor design, uh, brace wall design, and soldier pile wall design. They're not. Uh, cantilevered wall design is integral to all uh, three of those uh, other designs. So moving on now, second point uh, on the learning lesson, question mark, question mark, dealt with the conventional cantilevered method versus the simplified cantilevered method. Uh, If you go to the U.S. uh, Steel Sheet Pile Manual, they'll give you two methods. The first one is the conventional method, and this one here that I'm showing you is the uh, use of the net uh, pressure diagram. Uh, And the one on the right is the simplified method in which I'm using a gross pressure uh, uh, method. Uh, the conventional method, basically, you end up with two unknowns uh, and two equations. Um, and in the simplified method, uh, you eliminate uh, 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 the second equation by replacing the stresses and the pressures at the bottom by a, a resultant load. And when you take the summation of moments, uh, a lot of things cancel out with your left with one uh, unknown. So the simplified method certainly is better. When I started this project, I I had the uh, 1996 uh, Caltran DOT, and I read a sentence in there, and I I suspect I misunderstood it when I read it, but it said the simplified method is useful in the initial design of cantilever cheap piling in homogeneous granule soils, but the conventional method must be used for final analysis. Um, Okay, but what I found was trying to solve anything with multi-soil layers uh, adding additional loads, surcharge line loads, foundation loads. Uh, I ended up with very, very complex uh, equilibrium equations that were really difficult even in MATLAB to solve. And, and this manual was not meant to, to utilize a program like MATLAB. Although there are uh, other methods, there are some ways to simplify that. But nonetheless, the simplified method is the one that's uh, pretty much been selected and utilized by a lot of different uh, uh, programs. Um, so uh, I have here in this next figure here is a braced wall uh, design example. We have three strut loads, and I, I'm showing you the final design, and there's a couple things I want to point out uh, that will be I'll re- refer to later in the presentation, and that is the, um, um, the picture on the right is basically uh, trying to uh, determine the strut load using the Trisagi Peck uh, uh, apparent pressure diagrams, uh, and for the uh, determination of the uh, depth of imp- uh, embedment, I'm using a Rankin method, not the Trisagi uh, uh, 
effect pressure distribution diagrams. In any event, um, just keep that in mind. But what I want to point out in this slide is that once you have your pressure distributions uh, uh, assumed, uh, you resolve them into a force and the location of the force. And the problem using the simplified method becomes very, very simple, and you can just simply use a, a Excel file uh, to do calculation of moments and come up with an embedment dam factor to safety. So using a simpl simplified method is certainly the way to go. Uh, it certainly simplifies everything. All right, so, so the first question I had was, okay, who uses it? Uh, according to OI 2006, the sim simplified method is commonly adopted in engineering design, referencing Padfield and Mayer. I apologize for the academic presentation here, but I need to throw this out. Uh, support it, and the uh, uh, SWP 511 uses a simplified method for analysis. Those are the two programs I looked at. Um, so I was, quite, I was interested in where this came from. Where did the simplified method come from? Uh, the U.S. Uh, sheet, the U.S. Steel Sheet Power Manual references Tang 1962. I bought Tang 1962. Uh, Tang doesn't provide a reference. Um, so I went down to uh, Tersagi and uh, the other two there, and uh, basically I'll reference uh, a work from Bloom, 1931, 1936, and I question, who is Bloom? Well, it turns out that Bloom... Uh, his doctoral dissertation, 1931 in Germany, it's all in German, uh, is the person who developed the simplified method. And it, it's quite interesting. I, I can't say that I've gone through it in detail. Uh, uh, I tried using Google's German translator, but it didn't work real well. Nonetheless, I did put a figure in the right-hand uh, corner of the figure of this slide that you're now looking at. And basically, the figure 1.2 and I apologize, I didn't really explain how the simplified method works. I'm assuming you know, but in that method, you come out with a depth. Uh, uh, I called it DO in an earlier slide, uh, and then you multiply that depth by 1.2 or about extending it by about 20%. That is not a safety factor. That is part of the compensation for the simplified method. So if you look at this, the work in 1931 went from a fee angle of 20 degrees to a fee angle of 40 degrees, and so it looks pretty good. Um, and that's roughly where the 1.2, although if you look, you see it's a little less than 1.2. Um, I've not found any reference uh, that explains this in English. I hope to find one someday. Um, but in any event, I think the question here is, uh, what about clay? Does this apply to clay soils? That I don't know. I'm going to leave that to uh, other folks to either let me know or maybe I'll figure it out. All right, so moving on. Um, so the next problem that I encountered uh, was dealing with factor of safety. Which ones do we use? There are six different methods, more or less, depending on how you appraise them. Uh, but basically, uh, all six I've listed there, the first one, it comes from the U.S. Uh, steel manual, and, and just increase the depth deal by 20 to 40 percent. Um, another one is decrease the factor of safety KP. There's one where you can basically adjust the gross pressure, net pressure. There's another one called Berlin Potts, passive pressure. And then there's another one in which you adjust soil strength. is basically similar to the second one. In any event, when you start utilizing these, and again, starting from a student perspective, you start getting, in general, with granular soils are okay, but you start getting some very strange uh, embedment depths when you start getting with cohesive soils. Anyway, so I'll leave that to go to the, to the fourth one. Earth pressure determination for slope backfill with uh, wall friction, and I'd add question marks. And i um, basically going to pick on the uh, U.S. Uh, sheet pile manual, their first example, uh, in which they have a level backfill, um, granular soil, the angle of 35 degrees, and I'm not sure if you all can see the values there, uh, but... They, in the manual, explain Rankin, and they explain Coulomb, and then they discuss the issue of wall friction, and then they apply other methods with slope backfill, using, utilizing a log spiral or a Carrot's cursor method. Um, in any event, if you look at the first example in this manual, uh, it shows a level backfill, fee angle 35, but with friction, utilizing about 50% of the fee angle. Now, if you determine the Ka and the Kp, which are obviously critical to the stability analysis, uh, you'll see that uh, the first two 
uh, K is 0.27 and KP is 6.56. Okay, moving on to the next slide then. If we look at this, uh, how, do they, how they did this problem in the manual, they used the manual uh, figure 5A, which is the Karak-Kersel method, and at 35 degrees, you come on up and you hit the uh, uh, level slope uh, at zero. Uh, come across roughly about 10. Uh, I'm not sure where they got their significant figures, but nonetheless, uh, we end up with about 6.7. I did, and they got 6.56. All right, well, if you assume that you don't have friction, uh, you end up with 3.70. And that's a significant difference. And my point uh, I have two points on this slide. Number one is where is the guidance on utilizing friction uh, with a level backfill? Um, generally, when we teach uh, earth pressure, we talk about a slope backfill, uh, and the angle of the force acting on the wall tends to be equal to the uh, backfill. But nonetheless, there's clearly experience that shows a different situation in which uh, you can add uh, um, the uh, friction. Okay, so... Remember, I was attempting to do hand calculations and compare them to computer output. Uh, and you're not going to be able to make these equations out, but basically supportive, uh, and also the uh, SPW511 utilize a European code that was developed in 1995, and I put the equations in there. You can't really see them very well. Uh, I apologize. And I also have a mistake up there on the K passive. That should be 45 plus. Uh, 35 divided by 2. Um, in any case, I apologize for that. But anyway, nonetheless, if you use these computer programs and you try to calculate the uh, uh, KP and KA, uh, they're being calculated a little bit different than utilizing figure 5A that you see to the right. All right, moving on. All right, cohesive soils. Now, the, the, there are two issues here. Uh, the first issue is you put a very low... Uh, 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 undrained shear strength, uh, SW or C, as we generally use it, uh, we get really, really illogical depth and deadman depth. Uh, and that's generally due to the fact that we're assuming a constant uh, uh, strength with depth and the assumption that our Ka and Kp equal 1. So anyway, we, we do end up with, with and there are, there are, there is literature out there that explains why and, and how to overcome that. But again, uh, from a learning perspective for students and teaching uh, a class in, in, in beginning limit equilibrium methods without all the things such as the, uh, uh, in, uh, the uh, uh, interaction between soil and, and, and the wall, uh, it does become difficult. Uh, so that's the first point. The second point is how we calculate the critical height uh, for clay. And I'm going to have two figures there. The left one uh, basically comes from Tersagi 1943. If you have a cohesive soil and you have the unit weight and the co cohesion, the undrained shear strength of it, uh, Kursagi calculated a, uh, a height of four times the cohesive strength divided by uh, the unit weight. That's assuming no uh, tension cracks in it. Uh, Phileas also developed one. It's a little lower, 3.85. Now, if you go to the right-hand side, that assumes if you have a tension crack. So if in your analysis you're utilizing a tension crack, uh, the critical height drops to 2.67 times the cohesive strength divided by the unit weight. However, there's an, uh, also another assumption that that assumes that that tension crack has evolved all the way down to the potential failure surface. So that equation generally is used in that assumption. If you don't assume a critical, I mean, a tension crack, basically the computer program will assume four times in general. And I could be wrong on that, but I think that's correct. All right, moving on now. Uh, and, and, and so what do we do when we have a, a design 10-foot height wall in cohesive soil? and you basically have no pressure, again, to a student looking at this, what do we do? Well, the computer program allows you to use a minimum fluid pressure acting on the wall, and the British uh, sheet pile man uh, piling manual uh, basically recommends about a, a 31.8 pound per cubic foot, so that's how we typically do our designs. 
Now, moving on to the, the last one was probably the one that surprised me the most, again, that I, again, not being familiar with these type of designs, is the brace wall design and the calculation of maximum strut loads. Uh, basically, most folks in the United States use the Hirsagi Peck apparent pressure diagrams. I have X figures, figure 27.6. Uh, showing basically assumption, the general idea. The right-hand picture shows the two design examples. One is for sand, which shows a, a basically rectangular pressure distribution based on the friction angle of the soil. And the second one, so there's, there's two. There's been some adaptations to combine them, but in general, clay uh, has two uh, variations. And notice the equation again. It's based on the unit four. Uh, in other words, the unit weight times critical height divided by C should be either less than 4, you utilize the one on the left, and if it's greater than 4, you use the pressure distribution on the right. These are used basically to calculate the uh, strut loads. Okay, now, my questions. The, in designing a sheet pile design, you not only want the embedment depth, but you also have to calculate the um, shear and moment loads acting on the sheeting. And so I went back to PEC uh, 1953, but I'm referencing his 1973 edition, page 460 and 461. And I'm going to read three sentences rather quickly. Uh, in his statement, this presenting or in his paragraph presenting these pressure distributions, he states, thus, an apparent pressure envelope represents a fictitious pressure distribution for estimating maximum strut loads in a system of bracing. He goes on to state, it does not, however, indicate the magnitude or distribution of loading on the sheeting or whales. Third point he makes is no consideration is given in the procedure to the actual continuity of the sheet piles or shoulder piles because no continuity was assumed when the pressure, parent pressure envelopes were developed from the measured loads. So uh, I go on to my next point, which is, while the maximum strut loads can be determined using Kersagi Tech, uh, it appears that they are not meant to, to determine the maximum shear moments in the brace excavation sheeting. And so my question is, not being the expert, then why do we use the pressure distribution to determine shear moments? And again, if you start looking at some of the latest literature, they tend to basically recommend against Kersagi Peck apparent pressure distributions to determine sure moments, not maximum strut loads. All right, so my conclusions, and I apologize, I have rushed through these rather quickly, um, is that, uh, you know, there are a number of methods uh, for designing sheet pile walls. Uh, for example, selection of factor safety, earth pressure assumptions, wall friction. And so my statement that the devil is in the details uh, sort of applies because a lot of those details dramatically affect your design. Um, and, and I want to make a further point for someone not familiar with sheet pile design is that a lot of this is not, in my opinion, adequately explained in the current sheet pile manuals, making it difficult for beginning engineers to understand how these computer programs are working. Um, next point I want to make is, is that it seems that sheet pile design always seems to be at the end of foundation engineering books or it's not included. Um, and uh, one of the more recent foundation books, I think, has eliminated it. Um, but I want to end on a positive note, and I might walk the plank on this one. Uh, and I'm going to throw out an idea here, but I really think learning sheet pile design from a student perspective is really an excellent way to combine soil mechanics and structural mechanics. Uh, in fact, I would recommend that sheet pile design be taught before bearing capacity and settlement. And I'll probably end up in the water on that one. But nonetheless, if you really look at bearing capacity and settlement analysis, there are complex theories there um, in the understanding of the mechanics of the problem. Well, sheet piling design, in my opinion, is relatively straightforward with the exception of the detail. So anyway, I'm going to end right there and, and, and uh, take on any questions uh, you may have. Excellent. Thank you, Stan, for reminding us of the importance of what is happening when we use computer programs to design earth retention systems. I absolutely agree with you regarding the difficulty to learn how to do earth retention design with the currently available resources. As most of my own work is earth retention, I've found there to be many different schools of thought um, depending on who happens to be reviewing your calculations at that time. Um, 
with that, let's take two questions and then we'll move on to the next pre presenter. Okay, um, well, I'm going to have to refresh here. Uh, um, okay, uh, uh, one of the, one of the uh, listeners mentioned that there is a ninth filing handbook edition available, April 2016. Uh, that is good to know. I have to admit that I, I, I felt that that was a, a very well done uh, manual, uh, and it basically shows a number of very good design examples uh, that uh, I, I utilized. Um, so I'll just, that's not a question, that's a comment. Uh, second question is, which method is more conservative based on your study, simplified or conservative? That's a very good question, and it's one that I can't necessarily answer because after I realized that the simplified method is the way the computer program did it, I only used simplified method. Uh, I would question... Uh, how the simplified method uh, does apply to cohesive soils. Uh, I guess I'll have to leave that one at that uh, and uh, leave that answered. Um, Joel, do we have time for a couple more? Unfortunately, we do not. Um, okay. Thank you very much for your presentation, Stan. Okay. Um, with that, we'd like to remind you of Jet Filter Systems, David Jet Gentry, is a licensed marine contractor and founder of Jet Filter System and Blue Marlin Marine Construction. <laughs> to help prolong seawall life and reduce maintenance costs, David has designed a weep hole filter. A filter with a cleanable cartridge functions to relieve hydrostatic pressure while keeping soil from eroding. The Jet Filter line has expanded to include ABS, power-coated steel, and stainless steel, and supports different retaining structures such as steel, vinyl, and concrete. David graduated from the Divers Institute of Technology in Seattle, Washington, and is a professional deep sea diver. Next, we get to hear from John Edens. John has spent 27 years in the geostructural design build construction business, working for both contractors and consultants. He's currently serving as senior design engineer with Hayward Baker in their Dallas, Texas regional office. His experience includes design of soil nail and anchored walls, concrete diaphragm walls, soil mixing, jet grouting, compaction grouting, micropiles, drilled shafts, stone columns, and rigid inclusions. John earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering in 1989 from Virginia Tech. He is a past chairman for the DFI Soil Nail and Tyvek Committee and has been a presenter at many ASC events over the years. Now we will see the soil nail design previously discussed come to life on a large scale project with John's presentation. Thank you, Joel, and thanks to ASCE for allowing me to be a part of this event today. As Joel mentioned, I am a design engineer with Hayward Baker, and we are, according to ENR, the uh, ENR magazine, the largest specialty foundation contractor in the U.S. Um, we have numerous tools in the HBI toolbox, and um, as I'm sure many of you have seen our calendars over the years and received those. Uh, and today, I'll be presenting a case history from our Dallas office using soil nailing and anchored soldier piles. So as an introduction for those who may not be familiar with the method of soil nailing, I'm going to start with a little basic information about the method. Typically soil nailing can be one of the most cost-effective shoring systems on the market and uh, it will depend greatly on the soil conditions and the temporary or permanent nature of the system. So as you can see it is usually installed in cohesive soils and rock formations, but can easily be used in silty and clay sand materials uh, as well. Uh, it is a passive system, meaning the nail elements are not pre-stressed, so the system does require some movement in order for the elements to take load and provide the additional global stability to the wall. Uh, it's not recommended to put these systems in within the water table, uh, at least with, without dewatering the site ahead of the excavation. So just a little uh, sample cartoon uh, shows the progression of the, of the excavation and the wall. Uh, it is a top-down method for cut walls, obviously not a fill wall application. So this slide depicts the progressive nature of excavation and how the wall should behave. As the excavation proceeds and nails are installed, uh, the wall will experience slight outward movements, typically anywhere from 0.1 to 0.4% of the wall height 
uh, and also depending on the soil conditions. Mm -hmm. And you can see the critical slip circles that develop during the excavation process. And uh, that top figure represents the axial forces in the nail uh, when it achieves its full service load. So a typical nail head detail here for a permanent wall application in which we use a temporary facing on the wall uh, on the way down. And then uh, we'll shoot a permanent facing, uh, usually a thicker uh, wall facing on the way back up once we complete excavation. So here are the typical steps involved. You excavate the bench, drill the nail, usually six to eight inches in diameter, insert the reinforcing, trim and graft the hole, and install the bearing plates and the reinforcement, and then apply the shotcrete facing. So with that introduction to the method, I'd like to uh, present the case history uh, for the Wade Park project. This is a mixed-use development located north of Dallas in Frisco, Texas. And you can see there in the list the multiple components of the development and what this project involved. So Frisco happens to be one of the fastest growing communities in the country with a population growth of over 300% in the decade between 2000 and 2009, which made it the fastest growing city in the country during that time. So there are considerable construction projects uh, all over this area ongoing, including the uh, new Dallas Cowboys practice facility you'll see there in blue and uh, Greenbrier Mall, which is a very large retail mall down at the bottom right corner of the map there. <clears throat> so zooming in a little closer, uh, you can see the main drag running down the middle of the project, and we are installing an earth retention system just to the west of that in the shaded region. And this system was required for construction of a new underground parking structure. <clears throat> so zooming in a little tighter, uh, we used a combination of soil nails and anchored piles for the project. You can see the magnitude of the soil nail shoring required in the list there. And uh, this would be considered a fairly large nail project, at least uh, for this area out of this office. So in plan, we had several design sections to, sections to consider based on uh, some difference in excavation depth. And uh, we also had a considerable amount of uh, surrounding existing utilities that we had to uh, avoid. There's a couple of the design sections. Uh, you can see nail lengths are fairly uniform here, typically between 15 and 25 feet in length. Uh, the total depth on this excavation reached, uh, I believe, a maximum of about 48 feet. So I mentioned existing utility obstructions. We had to avoid those using piles and fairly steep anchors in, in the upper portion of the cut in conjunction with the sole nails. Anchors were uh, preloaded and are active elements as opposed to the passive nails. Uh, but these anchors were required for a section where the wall stepped back. Uh, and you can see uh, the nailed wall sketched in there uh, as a section beyond uh, in relation to the anchored pile portion. And in this cross-section, you can see that we actually had utilities that were falling within the sole nailed mass, so we had to use anchored piles here as well to avoid drilling those utilities. Uh, just a note, nails and anchors drilled through utilities tend to take a lot more grout than the planned quantities, so we obviously try to avoid those situations. This shows the typical anchored pile detail connections using anchors through a double channel pile section. Uh, this is a fairly standard uh, uh, application for, for what we do here. The temp wall, the temp shotcrete wall was about five inches thick and the, uh, the temp wall was shot in behind the flanges of the uh, channel sections. Now the permanent wall facing applied on the way back up was secured using Nelson studs which were welded to the front face of those pile sections. <clears throat> Same detail in, in cross section anchors are attached using a bearing plate placed between the channels and uh, they're placed against angle iron weller bars which are welded inside of the channel sections. So for this project we were actually installing a system in a limestone formation. Uh, you could consider these rock bolts as much as sole nails, but since this is a permanent system and given the weathered condition of the limestone and the intermittent layers of shale that we have here within the formation, 
Uh, we consider the retained mass as a soil having a friction angle of about 38 degrees and a cohesion of 1,000 PSF. And, uh, and so it, it really was intended to be a long-term solution. So the chart shows typical ultimate grout to ground bond stresses that can be achieved in different soil conditions. Uh, for soft limestone, you can see there's a range there of 150 to 200 PSI, but for shales, it is considered lower. Uh, so we used a much lower value than those shown for limestone for the ultimate bond value in our design. And we felt this was very conservative, and, and our nail testing uh, proved those values were very achievable. So for this design, we used uh, the S-Nail program from Caltrans to design the sole nailing. This is a long-standing sole nail wall design program. And uh, we uh, show here a sample output of the S-Nail run. Uh, we used number eight grade 75 all-thread bars for our nail elements, grouted into uh, six-inch diameter drill holes. And you can see here we're achieving our target factor safety of 1.5 for the permanent condition. We also considered uh, our standard construction surcharge in this design as well. So now going to some of the, the uh, job site photos. Uh, it shows a little progression of the excavation. Here you can see the initial cut. Uh, we like to try to take a little bit of a pre-cut initially, maybe uh, three or four feet at the top, slope that back when it's possible. Uh, one advantage to that is allowing us to get our nail, our first nail level down below utilities. Uh, like I mentioned, we did have utility interferences uh, within the soil nail mass on this job, so uh, that where we had those interferences, we did go to anchored piles. But in this case, we had, you can see the first bench for the installation of the first row of nails. Uh, you can see the drain board, which is placed uh, in between nails to allow drainage of the system. And you can see the reinforcing that's been placed prior to the application of shotcrete. Once that first layer is uh, uh, shock created and, and strengths come up, then we can proceed with the excavation down to the second tier. And here you can see we basically undermine the facing with the second tier, and uh, we're basically in about the same position minus the reinforcing uh, for the second tier application of shock creep. <clears throat> of course, this is a progressive system, so all the excavations are not equal on the way down, but uh, we do these in lifts and in sequence, so you can kind of see the staging that is required in order to install each level as we go down. Here we're about three or four levels down already. A little close-up shot of the application of the shotcrete. Uh, you can see the nozzle man there uh, applying shotcrete once everything has been placed, and uh, it's a fairly uh, effective and efficient method. In the areas where we did have utility interferences, when we went to anchored piles, you can see the uh, first cut for the anchored pile section. We did do similar lifts for the anchored section with shotcrete, even though the nails did not correspond with the same elevations as the, as the, uh, the anchors and nails. But the, um, the exposed face there, you can see the exposed front face of the channel piles. And uh, as we proceed down, you can see where we've gone between the pile sections and drill the anchors out. So I mentioned that the, the formation that we're in here, this limestone is highly weathered and, and a fairly variable type material. Uh, this just shows you some of the condition of the rock that we encountered as we made the cut. Uh, there was quite a bit of um, uh, areas that were similar to this that we had to deal with. One of the things about these types of systems is you, you do not want water to be collecting on the back of these systems. They're not designed for water pressure, so uh, it's very important that we were able to uh, divert water coming through these seams uh, to the back drains and down to the foundation system. So this slide shows uh, one more sh shot of the, uh, the variability of the limestone. Here we have a shot of the uh, finished excavation grade. You can see the, the shotcrete face um, was a screeded finished face. Uh, even the temporary face is, is fairly flush. And this allows us to uh, 
build a permanent facing with the reinforcement uh, with proper cover and, and those types of things that are important in that final permanent facing. We've got a shot of the, uh, the, the hole of the excavation. You can see the access ramp that was used by the excavator to get in and out of the hole. Uh, you can see the material standing up fairly well there. Uh, so in the temporary condition, we certainly didn't have any stability issues when we made each cut for installation of the nails. Once the excavation is completed at the base of the wall, they were able to install a permanent drainage system which was tied into some of the drains that we had behind the Solnow wall. And you can see that what is now covering the face is the permanent waterproofing that would go between the temporary face and the permanent face. This shot happens to be a different project. You can see the nails are much tighter spaced, but, but this is the, uh, the scenario that we will be moving into next on uh, Wade Park, where we'll actually place the permanent reinforcing and then um, we will cast uh, shotcrete in the permanent wall in a thickness of about eight inches. So the QAQC for, for nails and tiebacks, this is typical for what we do out of Haver Baker offices, is um, we do this using a, uh, a real-time data acquisition system. And uh, this is one of our field engineers conducting a proof test using a 30-ton hydraulic jack uh, with the movement being monitored by a dial gauge. The tablet in his hand is an HBI design data acquisition system which has the ability to upload tests immediately after completion to an HBI SharePoint website. So uh, the program also creates uh, detailing load and displacement graphs and provides um, a graphical analysis of the proof test data. Uh, so our design engineers can utilize this uh, access to make real-time evaluations as needed, which in turn corresponds to a lot less downtime in the field when results are not what we were expecting. So data is sent back to our main office and reviewed by the design engineer. Uh, this is uh, Mario Cofteris. He was the actual uh, engineer of record on this project for Harry Baker. So uh, I'd like to thank Mario and uh, the field engineers for helping me put this presentation together. And again, thanks to ASCE for allowing uh, our participation today. So with that, we can go to questions. Thank you, John. Um, thank you for sharing this large soil nail project with us. I'm always struck by the photos of deep excavations that can make an excavator look like a toy in a child's sandbox. Um, we got a whole bunch of questions. How about you take time for three of them? Okay. <laughs> All right, the, uh, the first question on the list here is what's the best angle for soil nails? Uh, these things can be installed uh, in a range anywhere from 10 or 15 degrees up to about 30 degrees. Uh, obviously, the steeper uh, the nail, the uh, more vertical component you're inducing on the system. Uh, the next question, how did you deal with vertical component of anchors? Uh, the anchors, uh, the piles were actually socketed. Obviously, this is a limestone material, so we did have uh, base resistance in that material. Um, when you look at the global stability of the system, we're accounting for both the active uh, nails and, or the active anchors and the passive nails. So we had to be a little careful about um, exactly how that vertical load was being transmitted, but uh, we did offset the piles slightly from the nail wall, so they did have adequate bearing capacity. Uh, the question being determining the bonding so soil for retained soil is fairly straightforward by using active wedge theory, but if the retained material is a rock where the stability is controlled by, more by fractures, how do you go about selecting the bonding zone? Well, in this case, as I mentioned, we considered the limestone material to be a fairly uh, weak weathered material. So in our design, it was very, very conservative to just assume that we would develop uh, shear planes that were more typical of a soil mass. Uh, when you're designing for rocks or rock bolting, uh, many times you have to look at strike and dip conditions uh, when you're in mountainous regions. Uh, the rock here in Texas is basically limestones and shales, and they're all fairly horizontally bedded materials. And so uh, the fractures, uh, even though we did see some, you know, you see some vertical fracturing due to weathering, 
Um, generally speaking, these rocks will, will not behave in, in a fractured manner. Uh, they tend to more, more in, a, uh, in a weathered rock uh, into a soil plant material. So uh, the next question, what were the utilities? Who owned them? Did you require their permission and approval to undertake the work in close proximity to their structures? Well, typically, you know, utilities are a part of the project. In this case, you know, they're all owned by the same owner and developer on the site. We were not going off site. Now, that's not always the case. We obviously will put these systems in adjacent to um, other property owners. But it, like I said, in this case, we didn't have that issue. Um, we try to stay at least five foot off of utilities whenever we can. Uh, that uh, will allow for some variability in our field uh, quality control on angles of anchors and nails and those types of things. And last question, how steep can you install saw nails and still be effective? Uh, like I mentioned, um, we typically like to see nails in the 15 to 20 degree range whenever possible. Uh, you get much more than 30 degrees and it starts to become a problem with the vertical load on the system, so uh, we don't like to uh, install them much steeper than that. And with that, I'll go back to you, Joel. Excellent. Thank you, John, for your presentation. Um, ERS engineers and supplies materials for many earth retention systems. Their team has the experience to solve any earth retention situation. Please visit www.earthretention.com for more details. The time has gone by very quickly, and we're up to our last presenter. Uh, Jim Schmidt has 33 year, years of experience as a geotechnical and environmental engineer and is the Director of Transportation and Infrastructure at Terracon. Jim oversees design, build, and P3 projects with Terracon. Jim received his bachelor's and master's degrees in civil engineering, civil and geotechnical engineering from Michigan State University. Jim is a professional engineer registered in 13 states and two Canadian provinces. Jim has authored and presented numerous papers on MSC wall design and construction and was part of the Blue Ribbon panel that evaluated MSC wall movement for the North Texas Tollway Authority. Some of the best and most difficult lessons only come from studying failures. We welcome Jim's experience to this platform. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate it very much. And last but not least, so we'll get right into this and hopefully we'll get done on time today. So MSC walls, we, we love them or we hate them, and when we hate them, it's generally because they failed, and, and so when they failed, it's not a pleasant experience. So, there we go. So the question is, why do we need a change? And back in 1984, Whitman did a study, and he showed that structural designs should have a failure rate of one in 1,000 to one in 10,000, and I'll let you be the judge of that. And then in 1999, Dr. Song and Dr. Kerner looked at MSC wall failures, and they show a rate of 1 in 1,000 for MSC walls. And Dr. Kerner actually, in a discussion I've had with him subsequent then, says that's actually higher. So the question is, why do we need a change? And so I'm going to show you a series of slides of some failures that have occurred throughout the United States. And when you're looking at these slides, note that all of these walls are less than 10 years old. So the question of why do we need a change, and uh, you know these slides kind of show it as it is, and that yes, the answer is we do need a change. And all these walls were designed as conventional design bid build, and so we will take a look at that and, and what, what we can do to change this situation. All righty. So as we're looking at this, the question is, where do you want to put your risk? And I did this little cost study of, of what it costs to, to build an MSC wall. It's generally $30 to $65 a square foot. And then when you look at the stabilization, it's $60 to $130. And if wall replacement is $300 to $650 a square foot. So it's pretty expensive if you have to rebuild the walls. And so what do I, need, what do I say needs to be changed? And that is better communication between the designers better identification of conflicts, better documentation during construction, 
and, and the last but not least, accountability of all by all parties. So if we do that, and this is the experience that I've had through doing working a lot of design build builds or design builds and P3 projects, we get better results. We get walls that perform. We can do a lot of different types of walls. And we get uh, better results for us and for our own as designers and constructors and for the owners themselves. So as we look at this, what is the traditional information that we have? We generally have the civil engineer, utility engineer, drainage engineer, structural engineer, and geotechnical engineer working on their own reports independently. And the question is, who is looking out for their walls? And typically, since I'm a geotechnical engineer, this presentation will have a geotechnical engineering background. And so we're looking at the recommendations from the geotechnical engineer are pretty much based on a 30% conceptual design on the walls. And what we see in geotechnical reports are generally the recommendations are provided in lateral earth pressures. And as you know from doing MSE wall designs, the designers are generally looking for phi angle, cohesion, and the unit weight of the material. And so we give them lateral earth pressures and sliding coefficients. So the MSE wall designer has to interpret that from a lot of geotechnical reports that you'll see and have seen in the past. So with that information, we have our traditional plan sets that have the civil drawings, utilities, drainage structurals. We see some standard designs. And you see a lot of geotechnical reports that are for information only. And so the question is, who's looking out for your wall? Because each of those different utilities are, or different designers are working independent of each other. So you see your traditional plan set, and it has a traditional line and grade for your, for your wall. And it may have, some, you'll have traditional details. And then you'll see a lot of your MSC wall standard details, and they'll come from some of the DOTs, some of the city agencies, and what have you. And um, then, then you also see these standard details that just show standard properties for materials, such as random backfill, select backfill, and that type of thing. So those are the standards that we have. And then we go into construction. And then all of a sudden, if you're on a DLT project, you might have shop drawings that are pre built, prepared by the MSE wall designer, and the construction manager reviews the shop drawings. Construction manager coordinates with the contract to resolve field issues. And again, who's looking out for your MSE wall? Because you don't see the designers as part of this looking at your shop drawings. So again, who's looking out for your wall? So you see a, a standard flow chart of what you might see under design bid build type work, and what you see in the circles is what you don't see, and that is missing, and that is your internal review from your uh, designers to review the information that is being prepared and for your cross-disciplinary folks to look at it. So you get your traditional results. And this is a, a wall that I call, it's a happy wall. And you can see that the wall is settled right at the interface with the bridge. And the wall didn't fail, but you could actually argue that the wall did fail because the wall is not performing. So failure is a perspective of if for an owner. And sometimes the traditional results, we get walls that work, and they look very nice. And then you come back for walls that don't work, and here we have a wall separation. And, and then you come back and you, you might have another wall that does work. So it's kind of mix and match with the traditional results of what you get for MSC walls. So through my design build experience and research with MSC walls and being part of blue ribbon panels, I've developed what I think is a way to resolve this, and it's called the MSC wall engineer. And that person is the single point of contact they're in charge of coordinating all facets of the MSC wall design, including design and construction. They work out the conflicts between the disciplines, and then they verify construction. And what I say, who should be that MSC wall engineer? I, my suggestion is geotechnical engineer should be that MSC wall engineer because they understand the soil structure interaction. They have a civil background. They have, they're working construction to verify that the strength parameters they provided are actually built. 
So my recommendation is to have the MSCE wallet design engineer be your geotechnical engineer. So back to that, now we're looking at what information is provided. And again, this is a geotechnical engineering perspective. So here we have a spreadsheet that goes specific to the uh, MSC wall design. And so we have cohesion, friction angle for different types of loading conditions. And so now we're specific. And the project plans, the, the MSC wall engineer, make sure that the anticipated materials that are going to be used in design are clearly stated, and the standard spec sheets are modified to include site-specific information and not just your general information that you'll see from other typical standard details. Then they review the plans and the specifications, and not only do they review it, but they ask the other disciplines to review. Again, we're looking at accountability. So the civil needs to hold the art, the utilities guys accountable, and the drainage and the structurals, and vice versa. So they verify your parameters, they verify the conflicts, and then they get those resolved before it goes to the contractor or out for, for pricing. And how do we do that? FHWA has provided a lot of checklists to help us out in, in going through these reviews so we're consistent. And so they have a design checklist, and you can find that in their MSE wall manual. And you can see there's a lot of information, things to check, and um, so you need to get all your drainages in, involved. And your shop drawings, you need to do an independent design check of your shop drawings, and that means all your other designers are involved in looking at the shop drawings. And in doing the drawings and specifications, there's another checklist that the FHWA folks have prepared for. So again, more guidance of how we want to do this. And, and so this information is available for us. And then the design, the MSC wall design engineer or retaining wall engineer, pre-construction duties. They have to communicate with the contractor. And if you're going out for shop drawings, what is critical elements of the project? And you have to communicate those expectations. And if somebody's not familiar with how to build an MSC wall, you need to give them specific training. And that not only includes your constructors, but it includes your QA folks. And Speaking of the field, there's another checklist that FHWA has provided for us. So there's a lot of guidance out there to help us do this work. And then construction duties, you need to verify that the specified materials are being provided. You need to specify that the field engineering is, testing is being done. And you need to verify that the various disciplines are creating as built drawings and looking at it. And so they're involved too to make sure that the design is in accordance with what they want to plan or what they design. And um, the construction duties continue, you know, again, training for your project QAQC people. And last but not least is the project documentation, which is extremely important in order to document what was actually built versus what was actually designed. So what are some of the challenges that we see when we're designing these walls? And, and here's a challenge where a temporary soil nail wall was constructed and then the MSC wall was built in front of it, and lo and behold, the, the saw and nail wall didn't get built in the right spot, and so now the strap lengths are a little bit short, or they're actually they're too long for what was built. And so the contractor might go out and cut those off, but now the strap lengths are too short for the design, and who's getting back in touch with the designer to say, is that appropriate, yes or no? And so if we don't get back to the designer, they don't know, wall fails, everybody says it was built per the plans and specs, and off we go is getting together with the attorneys. Here's another one, controlling surface water runoff. And this is in your retained zone. And if this isn't taken out, we as designers assume a specific material, specific strength in the retained zone, and if this isn't taken out and replaced, we, it won't meet the specifications that we have. And again, if there's a failure, we won't know about it unless it's well documented. And then another challenge includes, here we go, um, you've seen this a lot, where there's gravel right behind the MSC wall face, and, but the, the reinforced zone material gets placed in there, and then the gravel cut, gets come back and placed later after the straps are placed in. So we need to make sure that the void space underneath the strap gets back filled in. And last but not least is the uh, final acceptance report. Very, very critical as to what we want to do because now we know what was actually built. 
And time and time again, I've done forensic work where the as built information was not available, and the owner's not happy because their wall's moving, and there's nothing we as reviewers can do to help them define what was actually built and where the problem may lie because we don't have critical information. So this is very, very critical to get this put in in place and completed. So if we do all this and we work through the situation, we get working with our contractors, designers, QA folks, we get good results and we can really build some really nice looking MSC walls, walls that are perform. Uh, nowadays, we, we want walls that are going to last for 75 plus years. And so those first few slides of 10 year old walls don't meet that criteria. So we need to make sure that we as designers and constructors can meet this criteria. So we saw this slide earlier on is where do you want to put your risk? Well, we saw the typical cost to design a, to build a wall and the cost for failure. And then the cost for the MSC wall or retaining wall engineer adds another $10 to $15 per square foot onto the price of the project. And that compared to doing wall stabilization or wall replacement is, is pretty darn cheap in my mind. So with that, that's kind of a new concept I've come up with and thought about and, and ways for us to get build competent quality MSC walls. And so with that, Joel, I'll open it up to um, I'll take a look at the questions and see what we can come up with. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing your experience reviewing MSC wall failures. As you discussed, good communication on a project, in particular at the handoff points, is critical to avoiding failures. The last slide is an excellent reminder for all of us of the importance of getting the job done right the first time, even if it means some additional upfront costs. Um, with that, we probably have time for four or five questions. Jim? Okay, uh, we'll, we'll start off with what is the most common reason for recent MSC wall failures, drainage, poor estimation and loads? I would say all of the above. Um, it's really not one typical thing. It's a compilation of things. Those walls that you saw early on showed a variety of different failures from basal failures to sliding failures to uh, drainage failures. But a lot of it, the most common reason for MSC wall failures is not being built per the, plans and, per the plans and specs because of conflicts with the utilities or conflicts with um, material types, uh, poor QA, and or the designers weren't talking to each other where, uh, say, a storm drain was put behind the MSC wall within the reinforced zone, and there might have been a little leakage and uh, this, the water started getting in behind the wall. So I think it's a combination of communication and verification of, of what we have available to us. Next question was, can we get a copy of the checklist spreadsheets? Those are, yes, you can get a copy of them. They're publicly available information, uh, the FHWA MSC wall design manuals. That's where I pulled those from. So you can get those right from the FHWA website. And um, another question of what percentage of failures are attributed to poor backfill compaction procedures. This is always the blame that gets placed when something happens. Um, I don't know what the percentage is. I don't, there's not been a study for that. That is one of many. And so it, it's a compilation of, again, the, the designers getting together designing what they need to design, looking for conflicts, and then verifying that the materials were actually, it was the wall was constructed per the material types that was in the design. Do we have time for any more, Joel? Uh, we have time for two more questions. Okay. And how do I feel about clay backfill in the grids? The answer is not very highly. I would never put clay in the backfill within the grids. Drainage is always an issue. And with clay in the backfill, we have a creep issue. So I'm not a big fan of putting clay within the backfill. All the guidance materials that you see do not want clay to be put in the backfill. So um, the recommendation is not to do that. And the last question, of, do we have recommendations on how to get the owner to include full-time inspection of MSC wall construction? 
that is, that's a great question because that is very critical to do that. And the, quest, the way to do that is to sit down and educate the owner. And if the owner doesn't want to do it, ask the owner why. Ask the owner if they have issues with their current MSC walls. Kind of have to get an understanding of where the owner is coming from and then educate the owner as to why that is necessary and needed. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for that excellent presentation on MSC wall failures. <laughs> um, as a member of the ERS committee, we would just like to thank all of our speakers, the GEO Institute, and our conference support staff for you know, making this conference a reality. We hope everyone has found some benefit that you can take back and apply to your job. The ERS committee would enjoy hearing your feedback regarding this conference. And if you go into the materials section, there is a link to a brief survey. It's only five questions long. Um, this has been our first free web conference, and we've experimented with a lot of different things. So if you could tell us what worked and what did not, we'd really appreciate hearing that. Um, as a reminder, about three hours after the conclusion of this event, the link you used to enter the live event becomes a link that you can use to rewatch the event. You'll also be able to access all the content in the materials section of the archived event. Another way to access this conference in the upcoming weeks will be to go to the GEO Institute YouTube channel. Please take your time to complete the survey today. PDHs should be up and available to everybody. At this time, there are two different PDHs available. First, the free certificate of completion, which will be sufficient documentation in most states. Um, it may even be sufficient documentation in the states that I previously had listed of New York, uh, Florida, Maryland, North Carolina, and a couple of others. These PDH, so in the second is to complete all the instructions provided to download a verified attendance PDH from PDH Online. For $6, you can register with PDH Online, print out a certificate that is valid in all states starting August 31st. We'd like to thank our sponsors one last time. We were sponsored by ERS, Hayward Baker, Jet Filter Systems, and Deep Excavation. With that, we thank everybody for your participation and we look forward to meeting you within the future or in the future. Um, I'm going to remain online and answer a few questions if people have them regarding this conference, how you access materials or your PDHs, but this concludes the presentation. Thank you. <laughs>